This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. So the theme of this guest planning episode is terrific beards. One out of three of us qualify, one out of three of us is aspiring, and one out of three of us is heaping scorn on the other members. So we're very delighted to be joined by Mr. Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn, how you doing? I am great, Father Gregory and Father Bonaventure. It's wonderful to join you. It's great to have you, Pat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wearing, a, you. I'm wearing a, a penguin as a beard. Nice. Well done. You have fit in. You have successfully fit in. I was once given a penguin, a stuffed penguin, I should say, um, by the missionaries of charity at a place where I celebrated mass for them at one point. And they're like, it is for you, Father. It is a Dominican. I was like, you guys are savage. Um, but that's true. That, that's, that's not pertinent in the present circumstances. What is pertinent is you. So, Pat, who are you? And um, where are you from? What do you do? What's good in life? Yeah, what is good in life? Well, I live in Wisconsin, Waukesha, Wisconsin, married to Christine, five children. Yes. We like to sit on the back deck and listen to old rat albums. Uh, but in my more professional time, uh, write a lot, do a lot of this philosophy business, mostly philosophy of religion and metaphysics. Also do a fair amount, oddly enough, in the, in the fitness space. I've got just sort of an eclectic background as I was going to school for stuff that was not fitness related, philosophy sort of personal trained people and did stuff with kettlebells and made YouTube channels around it. And that led to me writing about that stuff. So I've kind of got like two different worlds that I occupy, uh, but it's fun. It's interesting and it, and it keeps me busy and I'm very fortunate, very blessed. That's awesome. Wisconsin, Wisconsin is one of the best states. Uh, I have friends out there in Thorpe, Wisconsin, a uh, yes. small town of 3000, I think, or something, a little Catholic school with uh, two, you know, two grades in each thing and uh the cheese is spectacular um the amount it's of the quantity mm -hmm. the quantity of toads in that state it punches well above its weight for uh bufo americanas so which is the american toad um yeah the fantastic. wildlife out here is is quite exquisite i mean there's all sorts of creatures i'm constantly encountering i had no idea existed yeah, um, minotaurs yeah yeah and yeah centaurs and whatnot and the, oh the those are the beautiful. creepiest ones yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, these, there's these like cranes out here all the time. These weird, I have no idea what they are, but they're crazy and they're all yeah. over the place. Never seen them it before also, in my life until I got here. It also gets cold. Um, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and people are like, wow, you really got bad winters. Those are people who have never been to Wisconsin uh, because I would go out there in January and wow, wow, is it cold. I mean, freezing cold, like trying to have discussions outside holding um, a small fire, uh, and drinking scotch. It's just like, you're wearing 12 layers of coats and you're, mm -hmm. you're like, so the difference distinction between essence and essay, it's incredible. So we'll get, we'll, yeah, and we'll, and we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Thank you. It's a miserable winter. Fortunately, I don't have a commute or anything, so it doesn't yeah. bother me too much. And this, but the summer is more than make up for it. It's like the perfect they do. summer. Summers are spectacular. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. This is Wisconsin um, episode. Yeah. So apart from having to plug your whatever engine into the wall, lest it freeze in the great outdoors, um, uh, there are other advantages to your current state in life. One is that you get to write books with yes. reckless abandon or without whatever the words are, but you get what I'm saying. And uh, you've written one recently about God. Would you tell yes. us about the book? Yes. Well, the book is called The Best Argument for God because I like modest titles, but I always... <laughs> tell people that I just said it's the best argument. I didn't say it was a good one, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. I take it back. I think it is a good one at the end of the day. And it's not just one argument. It's a sort of, uh, it's a collection of arguments. It's a cumulative case. And something that I think both of you will appreciate is it started, um, its inspiration in seed form was, of course, from St. Thomas. And if you go to his little summa on the section concerning the existence of God, you'll know that he has two objections, which is interesting because it's such a big question. You think, well, just two objections, right? It's mm -hmm. like, why? Surely there's more than two objections to the existence of God. And there both is and there isn't, right? There's lots of objections to the existence of God. I treat a fair number of them in the book, but I think there's really only two fundamentally interesting or serious objections. And they're the two that Aquinas gets after. The first, of course, is the problem of evil. And I do have a fair amount to say about that in the book. Uh, probably too much. It's the longest chapter. Um, but the second one is what really inspired the book because it's, it's effectively this, you just, you don't need God to explain anything. The principles of nature are enough. And this interested me for several reasons. One is before, um, 
I made my philosophical move back when I would have considered myself a naturalist. This is sort of what I probably would have said that you just, you don't need God. Science has got this right. Um, but in a more sophisticated and contemporary form, this is, this is something that you actually see a lot of modern day naturalists advancing and they might present the argument kind of like this. They might say, Hey, look, if two theories explain just as much, believe the simpler. Well, guess what? You know, uh, theism or classical theism and atheism or metaphysical naturalism, they're on an explanatory par. But naturalism is simpler. So we're going to go with that, right? Now, that isn't like any sort of strict disproof of God, but people think that that is a serious consideration to sort of endorse or adopt a naturalistic paradigm. And naturalism is just a philosophically developed form of, of atheism, which denies the existence of God. So I wanted to tack I wanted to tackle that argument and I wanted to make my thesis sort of its reversal so that the fundamental argument that I present is look naturalism can only explain some but not all of what theism can but only when strapped with vastly greater complexity and then the entire aim of the book is just to kind of line up what I take to be the relevant explanatory targets that any sort of worldview or philosophical big picture needs to give some sort of adequate story about things like contingency consciousness, stability and order, suffering and evil is one of those, uh, mor the moral dimension is another. And at every at every one of those sections, and each one is a section in and of itself, uh, I'm either more or less aggressive. In some sections like contingency, I say there is just, there's no naturalistic option even available here, not, not, not anything in, even plausible. Uh, when it comes to some of these other features, I say, okay, there's kind of a naturalistic explanation if you're willing to be really ad hoc uh, but it's just not as good as a theistic one, and it complicates the theory to the point of it being just essentially a grand conspiracy theory and completely unbelievable. So that's what the book is about. And yeah. And there's oh, a lot in it. It's, two, it's 256 that's, pages. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I think it seems like to me, uh, Pat, it's kind of like a, uh, we call it a transcendental argument in a way that you're using those kind of ways that um, here is a datum. You want to explain contingency, <clears throat> suffering, blah, blah, blah. And then let's regress. Let's, what's the best explanation for this? And most people would say, well, the best explanation, as you say, is, is kind of like the materialist one. But I think you're right to say people should uh, be wary of that because there might be a lot more going on that's required to explain the actual datum of it. Um, so particularly in the contingency ones, you say, or even the other naturalistic ones, I think people, people assume that obviously science just can explain everything going forward. When sometimes I think this transcendental approach is, is a helpful one to say, hey, what do you want in the, in the universe? Like in your universe, what do you think has to be here and what doesn't have to be here? And they say, well, you know, persons and dogs and cats and uh, I don't know, windmills and some birds and this kind of stuff. And I want physical laws. And you start piling up this like shopping cart, you could say. And then they go to the checkout line and the transcendental approach is like, okay, you owe me God. And they're like, no, I don't. I owe you stuff. I owe you like matter. And you're like, nah, you don't. Because you see, when you get all those things, you can only pay for that with God. And it's a nice, it's a nice way of, of arguing because it doesn't go ahead right off the bat and say, hey, God exists. Here's how he exists. And people are like, yeah. I'm not interested. They're more like, hey, you know, love exists and people exist. Yeah, I know that. I know that. You know how we're going to pay for that? Uh-oh. You know? So I think it's, yeah. that's a nice move. To, it's a it's a nice move today they make. And if that if if I'm, is that sound something of what you're uh, what you're it, aiming at? It it does. I mean, in in a technical sense, I don't present a, a strict transcendental argument, at least as mm -hmm. it's kind of understood by contemporary philosophers. What I do, but what what you're saying definitely maps onto my general project. What I do is I actually blend two different sort of methods or approaches mm -hmm. to God, and I call them the old school and the new school approach. Right. So the old school approach is sort of what Saint Thomas did. It's a metaphysician out in the field, right? He's sort of carving reality at its joint to say, hey, there's these features of the world that are so basic, they're essentially undeniable, that change occurs, that things have parts, right? And then what he's going to do is through his deep analysis uh, of these various, you know, large scale features, uh, he's going to argue that the necessary condition for, for, for all of these is something that sort of escapes or transcends that category, right? You want to make sense of changing things, you need the unchanging thing. You want to make sense of the composite thing. You need the absolutely simple thing and so on. And so you want to make sense of the contingent thing. You need the necessary thing. So it that, that's definitely, I, so I develop a very sort of contemporary um, mm -hmm. traditional metaphysical proof, if you want to call it that, at the beginning of the book. 
And then what I do is yeah, I, I make the best case I can. I say, I, I really do think that this is, you know, certainly convincing, if not as compelling as any sort of philosophical case can be for anything for the existence of God. But here's the other cool thing about this. You know, we spent a lot of time doing some, you know, at times crazy metaphysics, but now we actually have a pretty refined God hypothesis, right? Like, you know, we're, I'm not saying that we grasp the essence of God, but we, we have something sort of well-crafted about what we think the root of reality is. Right, that eternal, omnipotent, yep. omniscient, unchanging, purely actual being whose essence just is its existence. Right? Great. Now we can shift methodology and do what the contemporary philosophers like to do, which is called this worldview comparison game. Right? And what they do is it's, it's kind of scientific, right? They're like, okay, here's my hypothesis. Here's your hypothesis. Let's see which has better explanatory comprehensiveness and uh, simplicity. In the relevant respects, right? So, really, they're asking, like, which hy which hypothesis better predicts certain features of the world that we see? And you listed a number of them: persons and love and knowledge and all these sorts of things, right? And um, I think there's a decisive case to be made there for that theism has enormous advantages in terms of what it predicts and anticipates compared to naturalism, which is really just a hypothesis of indifference that whatever fundamental reality is. It's not either benevolent or malevolent, and it's not aiming at anything. Uh, so the, the the immediate problem with the naturalist is that, like, what do you what do you expect from that? The answer is nothing, right? I don't expect anything from that, right? So now you got to kind of start wiring in more to your kind of base or, or root theory, which is not the case for theism. You kind of have a very simple root, an ontologically simple being that is just being of pure perfections, and just through basic plausible principles of the good being self-diffusive or uh, principles concerning value, you can greatly anticipate a world just like ours. The only kind of initially stubborn thing is that problem of evil, right? And you just have to be able to tell a story about that at some point. Yeah. And so I, you know, so once I shift that methodology and say, look, if contingency didn't conv totally convince you of the existence of God, and I also focus on compositeness too, through this traditional approach, we can shift and take the contemporary approach and see how classical theism outpaces metaphysical natural on all these other points as well. And at the end of the day, it's a simpler theory in the most relevant respects of both ontological simplicity, the number of things you have and how simple that thing actually is, and theoretical simplicity of how much information it requires to describe and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a little complicated, but I think what you described generally maps with the, the sort of two methods that I take for yep. kind of getting confirmation of, of theism. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So you said that you engage with the problem of evil in various registers or at various points in the book, which I think is on a certain level, the most puissant. I don't know what that word comes to mind, but regardless, it does. Um, it's the most eloquent or it's the most powerful. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I was having a conversation with. Yeah, nice. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody recently and he was advancing certain arguments against the existence of God by appeal to, quote unquote, problems of evil. One of the ones that he was describing was, okay, so it seems like in the quote unquote dispensation of salvation, you have these rank inequalities. This is like a, a variation on the divine hiddenness argumentation. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the dispensation of quote unquote salvation, you have these rank inequalities. So there are people who just don't hear the announcement of the proclamation of the gospel. There are certain, you know, like races or ethnicities or nationalities at this stage of the game where Christianity has taken root at a much, much, much lower rate than other races, ethnicities, nationalities. Um, you just have historical accident whereby certain crises and scandals pile up in this corner of the world, but not necessarily in that corner of the world. And so from his estimation, it's just not fair, which is a kind of evil insofar as the people who have been given less should be expected to, you know, respond with less, what, uh, alacrity. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to these types of problems, of evil of various sorts. You know, you hear people talk about animal suffering yeah. uh, or you hear people advance kind of like Buddhist objections as if God were responsible for reducing the amount of physical pain or like material destruction in the universe. Mm -hmm. What do you think is a good approach whereby to begin addressing these concerns? Yeah, boy. Well, I mean, there's a lot there, right? So this is why this is an enormous chapter of my book. So when I think about the problem of evil, I'm thinking of the evidential problem of evil. So if, if people are kind of unfamiliar with the, this wider debate, you've got the the, the older logical problem evil, which says there's got to be some sort of contradiction between God and negative states of affairs. Most philosophers have thrown that into the dustbin, including atheists, because nobody's kind of been able to pull out what exactly that contradiction is, largely because they haven't been able to prove that God couldn't have a reason, a sufficient reason, morally justifiable reason 
for allowing this particular distribution of, of suffering and pain, right? So then the, the debate then shifts towards this evidential problem of evil. Well, then it's kind of this worldview comparison thing. Well, they say, okay, all right, maybe God and evil are like compatible in a very broad sense, but just given how many of these awful things we see in the world, you just listed at least some possible contenders, some of the things you listed, it's, we just don't see the full picture. So we're not actually sure that they're totally negative, right? Um, but take animal suffering, right? They'll say, well, this is just much better to be expected, right? If the root of reality is totally indifferent, it doesn't care about anything and, you know, the evolutionary processes and nature is red and tooth and claw, right? That just fits a lot better. It's a lot better anticipated on the naturalistic hypothesis. Um, I don't get that same anticipation from the God one. So it's evidence for naturalism over theism. How much evidence? Different people will say different things. Maybe it's a huge amount of evidence. Maybe it's slight. Okay, so that's the problem we're dealing with, right? How to respond. There's a lot of ways to respond. I'll, I'll map a, a few potential, I think, viable strategies, and then I will give my preferred strategy, which is very long and technical, but I'll try and condense it. So the, the first thing is you can just do uh, Father Brian Davis's God exists approach. And this is like, well, what didn't you understand about demonstration, son? I just proved to you that God exists from the argument from change or the argument from contingency. Uh, so if two things are actual, God and negative states of affairs, and be careful with the term actual privation theory, but I know you guys want to talk about, then they must be compatible. So at worst, it's mysterious, but it's not a reason to abandon theism, for example. That's kind of the, not, not I'm not saying that's going to like super satisfy the skeptic, but if you're somebody who already thinks there is a really good case to be made for God, that's a totally legitimate option. And you can just sort of live with the, the mystery, at least philosophically, and then you can look towards revelation for further answers, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the one approach. Another approach, of course, is sort of a more skeptical theistic approach. And this is the idea that, look, just because I don't see a reason for all this stuff, that is not a good reason to think that there isn't a reason, right? And we can kind of motivate this with certain, I think, highly relevant analogies. They're not perfect, but they're relevant. If I'm playing chess against a chess master, uh, I'm probably not going to see the reason for every move the chess master makes. Why? Because I suck at chess. I don't, I hardly even know how to play chess. I'm a total neophyte, right? But if I know that, that he is a chess master, then I can infer there's probably a really good reason for all the moves that the chess master is making. Now, whatever the distance is between me and the chess master, that is infinitely eclipsed between whatever the distance is between finite cognitive beings that are just a very small part of the whole and God and the reasons that God encompasses when he orders the entire cosmos to a particular end. So not only should we not be surprised that we're not gonna see the particular reason for every instance of evil or suffering, but I would say that we should actually expect, given a theistic worldview, that we would not see the particular reason for every instance of suffering. We might have broad understandings of why God might allow a providence of suffering, but I think that we should also assume a certain posture of humility, a sort of modest, but not overly skeptical theism. Now, I think we can actually go a lot further than that, but some people like that approach. Now, what I do in the book is I do, I do two things, kind of a one-two punch. The first thing I do is actually take back from the naturalist. And I say, hold on, you're way too quick to think that this world and this distribution of suffering is actually likely on naturalism. The hypothesis of indifference doesn't predict that there will be suffering at all. You've got to add a lot of stuff to that, right? Uh, this world, suffering is, we might say it's sort of, it's, it's posterior, like causally and logically to a lot of stuff that comes first, right? Complex biological organization, physical fine-tuning, order and stability, the emergence of consciousness, presumably suffering is only a problem for conscious beings, right? And at every one of those points, you've got a huge explanatory conundrum for naturalism, right? In fact, I think they effectively eliminate naturalism at the race. So if you think of an obstacle course race, right? It's theism and naturalism. In order to even get a chance to like compete at suffering, there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be cleared beforehand. And I'm claiming like naturalism was eliminated at obstacle one. You got to get to like obstacle 11 before you even get a chance at 12, right? However, even if you grant that the naturalist somehow cleared all those other obstacles, contingency and order and stability and fine tuning and consciousness and, and all that, right? You have further issues. And this is where I get a little bit technical. 
in within a naturalistic paradigm concerning philosophy of mind and and pain. So I'll I'll try and simplify this as as, as much as I can because a naturalist will say, look, evolution makes a lot of sense of all the pain and suffering that we see. You know, it's 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 ruthless, it's blind. Pain gives us reason to avoid things, and pleasure gives us reason to seek things. So we got a good explanation of of why there's all this pain and pleasure and why things are a, a total mess, right? But if you're attentive to what is going on in naturalist metaphysics, you've got a, a really big problem here. Because for a naturalist, the qualitative dimension, most naturalists anyways, the qualitative dimension, the what it is likeness, the feelingness, plays no relevant causal role. What's doing the causal work are just the sort of mindless atoms and blocks underneath, right? And now we've got an explanatory problem. Because nat evolution selects for functional or physical outcomes. It doesn't care about what something feels like. So as long as your joints are getting in the right place, it doesn't matter that there's any feelings at all. And it doesn't matter what the feelings are because they have no causal influence on the sort of mindless actors underneath. So in naturalism, this is a position known as epiphenomenalism. So a lot of naturalists are epiphenomenalists when it comes to, to mind. Uh, and what that and an epiphenomenon is just something that is caused, but causes nothing. Think of like a foam that sort of rides atop the, the ocean, right? It's causally irrelevant. Well, this sort of disconnects the the explanation that the naturalists thought they had for the distribution of suffering, because the feelings, the what it is likeness of suffering doesn't play any functional role in this. So you don't have an explanation for it. You have zero explanation for it. And if you have zero explanation for something as a naturalist, then the theist only needs a very bad explanation to be the winner in the race. Like some explanation, if it's very bad, is better than no explanation. So that's a that's a very technical point and it goes into philosophy of mind but i also show no matter what option you take for a naturalist in philosophy of mind you're going to have this same problem so when you try to be consistent within a naturalistic worldview and you actually look under the hood you're not just doing the kind of superficial thing you realize the naturalist does not have a good explanation or anticipation for the animal suffering or the suffering that we have or any suffering at all it doesn't make this prediction uh with any sort of degree of, of accuracy whatsoever and then at that point my sort of my, my, my other move is to just give a theistic story that I think is highly plausible, grounded in tradition concerning God's goodness, providence, the sort of necessary things that, that come with governing a material universe as some things increase, other things decrease, the complex interplay between grace and free will and salvation. There's a lot there. Uh, we can go into it if we want, but it would probably take forever. Um, but I, what I'm doing is I'm showing that there is these flow from an understanding of classical theism. And once you understand that these are consequences of the theory, not internal complications, we actually have a story that does not make this realm uh, of suffering so surprising. So when you, so super, superficially, it might seem like atheism has an advantage, but my argument is substantially, when you really dig into each of the theories, the evidential problem of evil is completely reversed. It actually tips the scales in favor of, of theism. Sorry, that was very long. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah, quiet no, I think, um, so no, Pat, I think you're, I think the, the general trend, uh, which I think you're, you're appealing to, uh, sort of consciousness problem and all of this, in a general terms, I think you're right to say that um, for a while, naturalists have had the, the presumption of, uh, of the benefit of the doubt, you could say, of in arguments, such that the theists have felt like they've had been the ones that had to work on the burden of proof to commit to why, well, why it's okay to bring in a weird god, you know, a simple being, right. blah, 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 blah. But it's been the last maybe 20 years or something um, since the work of some really good analytical theists, right? Alvin Plantica, Richard Swinburne, um, others who have, uh, Brian Leftow, of course, mm -hmm. um, who have worked hard to show that actually um, naturalists believe weird things too. Uh, and you're going, everyone to explain things is going to have to bring in uh, weird things. And that it's in a sense, like I, I think of it as you're going to have to, you've got a lump under the rug at some point and you've got to put it somewhere. You can't get out of the room. You're going to have, if you consider it a lump, let's say weird things, weird things are lumps. Um, and the naturalist for a while was just like, well, I don't have any of those. You guys got to hide something under a desk, you know, and get me not to look there. Right. Like, uh Oh, but I think with the question of consciousness, with the question of some of these other things, questions of, of modal metaphysics, other, you know, possible world. philosophers, right. qua philosophers have said, actually, we got weird things too. I mean, one of the going theories in, in uh, metaphysics right now uh, is that every single world 
that is possible is actual, right. such that at any given moment, there are as many me's as there are possible me's branching out over and over again. A multiverse, right? Mm-hmm. Like not even multiverse in the way that, I mean, Marvel's universe is stable. Uh, if it is stable, it's a multiverse. But I mean, this is an almost infinitely spanning multiverse. And you might think, wow, that's nuts. Um, and that's at least as nuts as a simple being. So I think the the, the nice turn we've made in analytic uh, theism and analytic metaphysics is that, in a sense, we've all committed to the fact that, hey, everyone's got weird beliefs. You get yeah, to come in, everyone spooky. gets to like admit this. There's, it, you're going to have spookiness no matter what, because we're dealing with at basic realities. And the question is, what do you feel comfortable with in terms of spookiness? So I think that's good. The second thing, though, I want to mention or ask you about is a lot of people might say, well, who cares? Um, because the... The proof that you get from God's existence, as you know, gives you like this eternal being who is mm, maybe good. Depends if you're a Neoplatonist on diffusion, um, but he's he's eternal, he's unchanging, all this kind of stuff. But I mean, the God I really care about is not that God. The God I really care about is the God of Jesus Christ, yeah, and it I'm is in. the 50th anniversary of Fides et Ratio. Um, and most people who have ever believed in Christianity have mm-hmm. not done so on the basis of super cool double way uh proofs so yeah. someone might say <laughs> is this is this helping what do i do with faith and reason and is yeah. it, can reason get in the way of faith so what do you say to uh what do you say yeah. about on the 50th anniversary of faith of fides et ratio um what's what's the, what's the use of this stuff yeah yeah great great question father and i have something to say about this in the book in fact it's in the section of the problem of evil so i guess i've kind of got a neoplatonic you know um theme uh, in you me. dog yeah i know i know i know this might not always be be hip in in certain circles but but it's true uh and i'm inspired by people like norris clark and you know he thinks and i think he's right about this that you can get really strong anticipations just from good philosophy towards something like the incarnation and the atonement right so to kind of like just put it yeah. put it put it poetically and i'm borrowing from from clark here you know, he thinks that it's not implausible, and I agree with him if you hold these sort of principles of the good as self diffuses and stuff like that. You know, God is God is perfect. So you might think, well, why does God create? He doesn't need anything, right? But Clark will point out, look, there's really kind of two ways to enjoy one's goodness. You can rest in it or you can share it, right? And obviously it, it, it has to be the, the, the second, right? That, that if anything explains God's impulse to create a sheer act of loving gratuity, right? And then from there, We can anticipate a great sort of spread of creation, the hierarchy of being, as it's called in the tradition. And, you know, Thomas is big on this, Uh, but also, you know, it's, it's good to bring things about. It's, It's good to bring about a hierarchy of being. It's better to bring them somehow into union with the Godhead, right? Now, there's a problem because like, how do rocks commune with God, right? They're sort of unconscious, right? Well, what Clark sort of, yeah. Yeah, sort sort of, right? So what Clark and others will say is, well, look, what God can do is he can create beings that sort of are fusions, right? That sort of gather up within themselves everything in the material cosmos and then kind of kiss or merge with the higher spiritual intellectual realm. And that God can then pull those beings into union or at least invite them into union with himself. And if that's, if, if that's the case, then the sort of entire spread of creation comes along. For the bride, so you have this incredibly beautiful sort of return to the source, right? But you look around, you see the problem. It seems like things have gone awfully wrong, right? And you can kind of see what I'm getting at. This kind of sets up, I think, a very strong anticipation for something like the incarnation, right? That God is going to fix the mess that we created, and He's going to do it again by this union, this incredible union. And this incredible outpouring of love and how magnificent that is. So I don't know, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I actually think good philosophy can go pretty far, pretty far, at least towards suggesting or raising the prior probability, if you want to talk technically, of the Christian story. And then, but if that's Mm -hmm. the case, then you don't need like huge, hard, knockdown historical proof because philosophy has just lifted a lot of that burden, right? So I think there's, there's a strong suggestion, a strong case that can be made. Maybe it's not a definitive proof that points very, very directly towards the Christian story 
in particular f- for many reasons. So I'd, I'd at least want to say something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and dear listeners, uh, it is the 25th. I have jumped time. 25th anniversary of Fides Ratsi, not the 50th. Um, a long day in the classroom today. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of a, yeah, I like the Cinderella story kind of business. Um, you know, the shoe is ready and, uh, you know, and, right. and it just got to fit there. Yeah. Yeah. One might. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Boom. Um, Pat Flynn, we're actually at the end of our time. God's planning oh services this listeners by uh, giving them 30 minute podcasts so they can leave in a certain sense, you. you know, nourished, but still hungry and thirsty as is apparently good for general health. You're supposed to like leave the table 70% full and it can actually have negative health effects to stuff yourself. You know, the desert fathers that figured this all out in the fifth century, we're just downstream picking back up the pieces of a broken civilization. Yeah, um, so yeah thanks thanks for joining us final thoughts um the book when's it going to be published this episode is airing in like the middle of october so when is it going to be published vis-a-vis the launch of this podcast and uh, where do people find it yes my understanding is that the book will be released at all the usual places amazon and various bookstores october 17th obviously you can get it direct from the publisher sophia but yeah. So tomorrow, tomorrow, I guess, I don't know. Or, or if, are we in the future yeah. right now? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, October 17th and you, you can find it wherever, you know, Amazon and all those usual places. Yep. Okay. And then the last question is if you were to give a less modest title, I won't use the word bombastic because the title is no way bombastic. If you were to give a less modest title for this book, what would it have been? Oh my goodness. That's, I didn't even consider that. Um, I don't know the the cumulative case for classical theism, but that's not exciting. That doesn't that doesn't pack a punch. Nice. That, that doesn't yeah, sell nice, copies. Yeah. But that that's well, you could have done the more yeah. bombastic. And if Pat Flynn destroys atheist arguments for naturalism, <laughs> embarrasses, like, destroys, embarrasses, embarrasses atheism, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Obliterates, annihilates. Pat, Pat right. Flynn strides like Colossus over the felled corpse of all atheist interlocutors. Yeah, I need yeah. you as my copywriter, Father, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, an investigative study. <laughs> all right, so uh, we'll look forward to that coming out, or some version of that title. And so far as well, they'll. They've already printed it. So here we are. Um, So thanks so much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, love to your family. Yeah, thank you both. Really enjoyed it. Cheers. All right, turning to you, the listener. Not that we haven't been turned to you, but turning to you more consciously. Uh, Thanks as always for listening to God's Planning. Uh, Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, (laughs) It's funny, like every time we encourage people to do that, you can hear the hollowness of the appeal insofar as neither of us know what those things are or what they do. I think it's called X now. We're like, dear listener, please believe in elves. Um, They wear nice little boots. Okay. Uh, Like the episode, subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app and leave a five-star review. Uh, If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, uh, you can follow the link in the description and or show notes. And in the same description and or show notes, you'll find links for merchandise and then to sign up for the Young Adult Retreat, for which applications are still up uh, and available. Uh, So that's November 3rd through 5th in Malvern, Pennsylvania at the Malvern Retreat House. So I'm sorry, I have yeah, to interject. You know, I used to live in Malvern, right? Well, essentially, right next that. door. That's to that, why yes. we go. Yeah, it's exactly. a beautiful, beautiful yeah. place. So everybody should go. It's beautiful. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we're going to make a retreat, and it's also going to be a pilgrimage to the birthplaces and sacramental sites of Pat Flynn. So join us at the baptismal font wherein was raised this great bearded man. All right. Know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Planning.